Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and I'm going to be going over the UFC card for this Saturday from a DFS perspective. Um, had a pretty bad week DFS-wise last week, simply because the fight where I was about 80% uh, invested um, got canceled. <laughs> and that's kind of what happens. We did uh, get the Bobby Green uh, uh, save in the last fight, which broke us even in some of the bigger buy-ins. Thank heavens for that. But overall, you know, it's just nothing you can do about what happened last week. This week, we have a full 12 fight card, which, which means that we need to prioritize upside and not as much just try to go for the six winners in GPPs. The other thing I would like to point out is that this week, I'm pretty confident of what we're supposed to do from a GPP perspective. Now, remember, there's a difference between what the good plays are and what plays you're supposed to make, right? And what plays you're supposed to make really depends on what type of contest you're in. It's it's really not difficult to come up with what the good plays are, okay? But to figure out how those plays come together, particular to the type of tournaments that you're in, is, is very difficult. Um, but I think this week is, is pretty, I mean, I'm pretty keyed in on what I want to do this week. And that doesn't mean it's going to be right, but sometimes I'm kind of all over the place. This week, not so much. So we're going to get right into it, and we're going to kind of jump around a little bit. The reason why I think this, this card is pretty straightforward from an overall slate perspective is this. So there's a real difference between this top pricing uh, this top pricing tier here, okay? You have five guys, uh, five buyers above 10K, excuse me, above 9K, and two of them, for my money, are, 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 uh, are just unplayable. Um, so let's start with... Uh, for example, we'll start with Dakota Yoder. Dakota's 9,300. And when you look at the inside the distance line, I mean, it's, it's, it's really, really bad for this, you know, for this price tag. I mean, you have Dakota is, what is this? Dakota inside the distance is plus, plus something. Uh, Dakota inside the distance, like plus 260. I mean, you just can't play this. Now, again, you can make the argument, oh, well, it's going to be really low owned. Okay, fair enough. Um, but it's not, you know, just because it, it's going to be low owned, I mean, it doesn't mean you're supposed to play it. You know, it's a 90, it's 9,300. And just even if you hit the 9,300 hour fighter, you still have to finish the rest of your lineup. So just because a 9,300 hour fighter is going to be low owned, that's not good enough to just justify playing it. It is going to be low owned. You want to know why? Because the metrics are terrible. So I, I'm not, I'm not going to be playing this. And because she's going to be low owned, um, Yoder on the other side is, is really isn't really going to be getting all that much leverage. And she's about plus 400 to win. So this fight for me is just basically a full fade and it's a pretty easy one. Um, and, and likewise, you have Chris Gutierrez versus uh, Alatang. So Gutierrez is 9K. And when you look at his inside the distance line, you have uh, Gutierrez inside is like plus 400 or something. I mean, he's a big favorite because he's technically stronger and, and he's probably going to, you know, win a, uh, you know, a very measured striking battle, but that's not what we're looking for in DFS. So while he might show up on some median optimals or something like that, just because of his win odds for my money in GPPs, he's basically a full, a, a full fade. Okay. Um, and because of that, unless Alatang had a particularly strong inside the distance line at what, 7,200? I mean, he would have to have an inside the distance line of a, like plus 300 at, at worst, I guess. But let's just plus 300. Let's take a look. Uh, Alatang inside the distance, it's like plus 500. You know, this is, it's, it's just not good enough. And as I mentioned, Gutierrez is not going to be particularly popular because his metrics are terrible. So you're really not even getting any leverage by playing Alatang. So, you know, right off the bat, I mean, these are, these are two fights, which are just for me, just complete phase. Um, and then on the other hand, you have three, the other three nine K fighters look like complete smashes, right? I mean, starting with Terrence McKinney, um, have the props been out on him yet? I mean, they're not yet, but I promise you he's going to be minus probably minus 300 inside the distance or at least minus 250. And I'll bet you he's even money at worst to 
win in round one, you know? So he's going to look extremely strong. Um, and he's a smash. Now, the problem is, as we get to lineup construction, is that everybody's going to see that, okay? And likewise, everybody's going to see that Gutierrez is, 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 has terrible metrics, that Dakota has terrible metrics. Um, and then you get to Lisboa here, who also is going to look really, really good. So she, let's take a look at this. Lisboa, her inside the distance line is minus, what is her? She's like minus 115, okay? Okay, it's not the best, but it's it's much stronger than those other 9K fighters. So I would rate her, I mean, significantly below, uh, what's his name? Uh, McKinney, but significantly ahead of, of Ducote and Gutierrez, for example. And then you have the third other 9K fighter who looks amazing, and that's going to be Edgar Shires. Now, this is like a little different because you have this fight, which is like minus a million to, to finish inside the distance. And there's finishing upside on both sides. Um, so let's take a look at this. So Chires De Silva or De Serta, whatever, like him inside the distance, he's like minus something like 150, depending on where you look. This, this, they want you to lay 250 here. Why wouldn't I why wouldn't I lay 160 over here, for example? So he's about minus 140, which is really, really good. Okay. And even De Silva on the other side, he's plus 300 inside the distance. And at his price, that's really, really strong. Um, so the point here is this. What's the difference between all three of these top fighters? They all look really good. One notable difference is that Lacerda on the other side of Kyrez rates to be a very strong underdog. People like to play him. He has, you know, he he's his his upside in his wins is is um it's kind of unarguable. I mean it's arguable but just because he doesn't win, but but in the hypothetical world where he does win, he rates to score extremely well. And on a card like this, you need that type of upside. So the point is, is that what people are going to do is they're going to play that Chires Lacerda fight, and they will play both sides. I mean, some people will play do 50-50. Some will do maybe 75 Chires, 25 Lacerda, you know, just kind of base it on the, on the money odds. Um, maybe people won't go 100% of it, but, but this is a, obviously a really key fight that people are going to want to get exposure to. So if you want to, so Chires has an advantage over these other two in that he gets a little bit of leverage, at least over what could be a pretty popular underdog, where Lisboa, her opponent is no one's going to play her. McKinney's opponent, no one is going to play him. So Chires, you know, has a little extra edge as, as far as leverage goes over these other two. The other thing is that Chires's metrics himself are just a little bit better than Lisboa. Okay. So his inside the distance line is like minus 160 and Lisboa is minus 115. So you combine that with the leverage. I put Chires a little bit above Lisboa. So you have McKinney Chires that rate to be kind of the two top plays. Okay. The, the, the issue is this. Okay. Is that a lot of people are going to do this. Okay? This is what a lot of people are going to do. They're going to play either, they're going to play McKinney, Chires, and a couple of underdogs we're going to get to. Or they're going to play something like McKinney, Lisboa with Lacerda. And then kind of do whatever they want here. Like those constructions are going to be, in my opinion, very popular. So even though these are all really good plays, McKinney, Lisboa, Lacerda, and Chires, if you play too many of them in the same lineup, you're just running the risk of being way overduped. Okay. So in, in GPPs, you have to avoid that type of construction. So yes, all four of those plays I just mentioned are very strong. Okay. But in GPPs, these are the types of combinations you probably are going to want to avoid. So how do we do that? Uh, well, we'll get to it.
first thing I want to identify are those kind of underdogs that people are probably going to play that make a little bit of sense. So let's say that you're going to have McKinney and, you know, let's say you play the McKinney and Chires combination because you're not going to be able to play all three. You can't play McKinney, Chires, and Lisboa. Uh, I guess you could, but there are very few really good 7,300 underdogs except for Lacerda. So let's say you played just McKinney and Chires. So what people are going to do are going to play the following underdogs. And they all are probably pretty good. But so you have Edge and Barbosa in the main event. All right. Well, we'll look at him and we'll see what he looks like. I mean, he's, he's an underdog. First of all, you look at his, it's five rounds to work with and his inside the distance line is pretty good. It's um, Barbosa inside the distance, like plus 200, you know, for his price at, 7,500, that's extremely reasonable. You know, it's actually really good. Um, and you compare that with, and you add the five rounds of upside, I mean, people are going to do this. They'll play McKinney, Chires, Barbosa is going to be a pretty popular underdog. And it makes sense. He's, he's, he's a good play. Um, other guys, other fighters people are going to play are uh, Irina Alexeva. Okay. Uh, she's coming off of, of a submission win over uh, Stephanie Edgar. And whenever you have a female fighter that that has some finishing upside, these are these are pretty these are pretty important fighters to kind of you know to key in on. So people are gonna play this one, right? Definitely. The the other one that again I think makes some sense is is Darren Elkins. Darren Elkins, he he, you know, this fight against TJ Brown, there's gonna be a lot of activity. Both fighters have takedown ability. Elkins has this reputation for having that, that dog in him. We'll get into more of that when we do the betting breakdown. And I'm seeing a lot of love for him in the streets. So he's also going to be kind of a sort of a popular underdog that people can kind of play. So two of these three, Barbosa, Alexiva, and Elkins, are going to be paired with, with McKinney and Chires, and they're going to be paired all over the place. Okay. So these are the types of constructions you are kind of going to want to avoid. Um, and we'll get to how once again in just a minute. But let's uh, let's talk about another fight, which I think is probably, uh, well, there's two fights I, I want to talk to you in general. Uh, I'll, we'll do three of them. So Christian Rodriguez versus uh, Cameron Samon, 8,400, 7,800. These are the types of fights that you really want to avoid on draft teams. You have two basically strikers um, who are durable, who are not, you know what I mean? And, and, and they're young. It's, it's, it's doesn't rate to be a particularly high pace. I believe that this fight is, is going to be a really good fight. That's most likely going to go to decision. Um, and you look at the inside of the distance line of both these guys, you have like plus 300-ish on both of these guys. And for plus 300, I mean, we just talked about Lacerda being plus 300 at 7K, okay? Um, so these are the types of fights you probably are going to want to avoid. Um, you can play some of them in in GP, you know, in, in MME or whatever, but these are the types of fights you want to typically avoid. Um, oh, here, I completely forgot about the uh, the other uh, another uh, kind of high price one. Oh, we'll get to this. Well, actually, she wasn't that high price. Um, actually, Maya's not that high price. So. But the uh, the Jennifer Maya fight. We'll take a look at that one. This is a fight that you probably are going to want to avoid. I mean, you have. Let's take a look. Jennifer Maya has just. At 8,500, her inside the distance line is at plus 900. I mean, you just can't bet that. Arajo, Arujo, whatever, she has a terrible inside the distance line as well. The only thing I would say is that she at least has some takedown upside. So I think that in her wins, it's likely to be accompanied by some takedowns. So I think that she can be, you know, she could be okay in like 20 max. Like she wouldn't be my, my top play or three max or anything like that. But I do think that Viviana Rujo could be a good mid-range play at 7,700 just because of her takedowns. 
Um, and again, sorry to be jumping around like this. We're going to get to the punchline in a minute. Jonathan Martinez versus Adrian Yanez. Okay, so this is, again, striker versus striker. So when you have these situations, you, you, you are completely reliant on this inside the distance line to give your, make yourself a good player now, okay? Because without those takedowns, you, you're not getting any of that extra, those extra points. So you look at these two, even though it's a pick em fight, and it's pretty much pick them on the uh, on DraftKings, you see one of them has a significantly higher inside the distance line, and that would be Giannis. When you look at Giannis, he's like plus 160 to finish, and Martinez is like plus 300. And again, you have this plus 300, I mean, you compare that to, to some of these even cheaper guys like, you know, Barbosa, Lacerda, you know. So Martinez is not going to be played. If anything, I would definitely include um, Giannis. I mean, his inside the distance line is just that much stronger. So he's going to be the preferred play. I imagine he's going to be probably a little more popular as a result of that. Um, but I don't think it's to be that chalky to justify, you know, overweighting Martinez to get some leverage. So what have we talked about here? All right. So we talked about these nine K fighters, right? McKinney looks really good. Lisboa looks good. Chires looks really good. We talked about fading Gutierrez, that whole fight. Okay. One thing we really haven't talked about yet is the main event. And also where I think and and uh, and where we're going to get our leverage. The other fight that we haven't looked at yet is Petrosky Pereira. So let's go ahead and do that. So we have uh, Petrosky is seventy six hundred, Pereira is eighty six hundred. So when we look at the inside the distance line again, you know we have. Two pretty poor inside the distance lines. You have Pajaya, like plus 170. I guess that's okay. You know, plus 170 at, at 8,600. I guess that's all right. Petrovsky has a really poor inside the distance line. It's like plus 300 at his price, but he also has some takedown upside. So this fight, I definitely think this kind of fits into what we want to do, right? Um, the inside distance lines are not great, but they're not terrible. But what it does, it sort of takes us off of that, you know, that stars and scrubs type build that I talked about, like the McKinney, Chires with, you know, with Barbosa, things like that. So I do think this fight is somewhat interesting. But to be ter perfectly honest, I'm pretty confident about this. The way you want to play this card is by identifying, is by keying on two fighters. And that would be uh, T.J. Brown and uh, Melissa Dixon. So let's talk about that. Let's first talk about Melissa Dixon. The first thing that you'll notice is that she's fighting Irina Alexeva. And as I mentioned earlier, I do think that people are going to go to Irina Alexeva as a very, you know, reasonably looking under, reasonable looking underdog, right? She just came off a first round submission. And people are looking for underdogs with upside. So she certainly makes a lot of sense. So when you can find a fighter against uh, someone who makes a lot of sense, then it's worth considering. The other thing is that Melissa Dixon, she's 8,600. So you're not really, you know, it's, it's, she's not going to look quite as good as these nine Ks, but when you get these kind of middle 86, 87, $8,800 bills, you get away from that you know, that, that stars and scrubs type construction. And the other thing about it is from a pure metric perspective, she actually doesn't look bad. You know, Dixon is plus 220 inside the distance. Um, it's about the same as Pejea, right? Is Pejea probably a little bit better? Yeah, Pejea is what, plus 160? I mean, close enough. And from what I saw, she has all kinds of takedowns in her arsenal. I mean, you just watch a little bit of the tape in her last, you know, couple of fights. She ended up like, like on top of people. And, and if, if things go the way that it could go for her, remember, Irina just, just got a submission pretty much off of her back. 
So I'd like to think that she wouldn't be opposed to, to getting that position again. So if you give like Melissa Dixon the opportunity, I think it's possible she gets multiple takedowns and scores 130 points. Uh, again, it's not uh, the likely, but it's certainly well within her range of outcomes. And when you compare that to uh, when you add in the fact you can get leverage against what I think is going to be a pretty popular underdog, or at least in theory, I think Melissa Dixon is a really, really strong way to start lineups. And the other one for the exact, you know, similar reasons is TJ Brown. Uh, I, I mentioned earlier, I think Darren Elkins looks like a totally reasonable underdog play. He fights for your money, whatever that means. Um, he, he, he's a dog, whatever that means. And he's got takedowns as well. So in his wins, he's probably going to score pretty well. So if you can get away with it and you get a smash out of TJ Brown, you could get some leverage against what I think is going to get, you know, be some Darren Elkins you know, sort of chalk. And when you look at his inside the distance line, his metrics, I mean, it's not bad. You know, plus 180 inside the distance. It's pretty similar to, to Dixon and, you know, uh, and Pahea. And he's got quite a few takedowns in his arsenal. We look at TJ Brown here. Um, I mean, he had six takedowns a few a few fights ago. He had seven takedowns in there, so he can do it, you know. Um, so I think that he has, uh, he's got, I think, significant upside uh, as well. So I think that 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 you start off in GPPs and you get away from that McKinney, Chires underdog uh, structure, or the the Chires, excuse me, or the Lisboa. McKinney Lacerda structure. And you start out with something like TJ Brown and, and Dixon. Um, I I think that you can you can build some good stuff. Okay. Uh let me throw in another uh two things about this card. I did not really talk about the main event. Um with the exception of identifying Barbosa as a good underdog player. I think that this card is one where you could probably avoid it. Now, remember, because of the way median projections work, both of these fighters are going to have very good projections. Whenever you have a five-round fight, both fighters are going to always look good. They're going to look, what, 60% uh, better than people in three-round fights. So in optimals, people are going to get to both of those guys. But in the 12-fight card, you know, you need upside. And I just don't think that this main event is such a lot to deliver it. So I'm probably going to be underweight to the main event. I I personally, well, I was about to say I'm not interested in, 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 in uh, what's his name, Yusef. But the thing about Yusef, what makes him interesting is because, as I mentioned, like Barbosa is probably going to be a pretty popular underdog for all the reasons I mentioned. So if you play Yusev, you might get some leverage against those Barbosa. So if you started out with like TJ Brown, Dixon, and say Yusev, you know, I think that this is, is, could be somewhat different, you know, um, um, you know, you can mess around with Saber Sam or, or the R or lineup page crew, whatever, and make rules to get yourself different. Like you can say, uh, okay, between McKinney, Chires, and Lisboa, I want max one or max two or whatever. You don't want to play, say, Lacerda and McKinney and Lisboa all three together. So you can you can mess around with it. Um, but I think these two fighters, Dixon and Brown, are are good starts. So getting a little bit different, getting a little bit of leverage, and getting you off of the chalky construction. One other little trick, one little thing which I would like to throw at you. And again, I've been talking about this concept a lot, and I never really tested it except for just doing it. But I, I kind of like this idea. Let's say that you liked Lacerda, for example. Or any underdog for 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 that matter. But let's say you like Lacerda at seven k. Um, he's seven k, and let's say you built the lineup like 
what, what's 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 a what's a good looking Lucero lineup? This this this. And, I don't know, uh, Bar Barbosa, um, Yanez, uh, and, and any of these turkeys that okay. Rodriguez, something. Okay. So if you built like a lineup like this, okay, which is going to be duped like all over the place. One thing that you can do if you, let's say you like Lacerda. I mentioned that Lacerda and Shirez were both going to be played. People are going to target both of those. What if in every lineup or at least a whole bunch of them that you played Lacerda, you left 2,000 on the table, 2,200 on the table. I want you to think about this for a second. Lacerda is 2,200 less than, than Chivas. And I already told you that people are going to be playing both of these fighters. If people run optimals, okay, and they get to, and the optimal, the computer, the, the whatever, just is grinding, and it gets to five spots, and there's 2,200 left, okay? Or 1,700 left, or 1,400 left, or 7,200, you know what I mean? Uh, left. Anywhere between 7,100 and 9,100 left. Uh, excuse me, anywhere, you know, 9,200 left or more. If it could get Chires in, it's going to put Chires in, right? Because he's going to project as a higher optimal than, than or a higher median than Lacerda. So all your lineups with Lacerda in them, if they leave 2,200 on the table, are going to be extra unique and extra leveraged because if you are leaving 2,200 on the table, all those other lineups with the other five players or mm -hmm. fighters are likely going to have specifically Chires in them, okay? So I think that makes a lot of sense, and it's something I've been kind of messing around with. And one way you can do that, there are two ways you can do that. One is, and you can do this with any underdog, but one thing you could do is you could build, let's say you were going to build like 30 lineups. Let's say you are going to build 100 lineups. You want to have, say, 30% Lacerda. You build 30 lineups, and you just put a, a max of a, of a, of 2,200 left, or a minimum of 2,200 left. So what is that, 50, 47, 8? So you do a minimum of 47,800 when you run your builds, a max of 47,800. That way, you're getting that extra leverage. Another thing you could do, and this is this is this is actually a little bit sneakier, is you build your lineups as is, okay, and you build like extra lineups with Chires, for example, and then when they're finished, you take the Chires and you literally cut and paste Lacerda where Chires was. So you build a good lineup with with Chires. And then you just swap him out for Lacerda. Okay. And again, it's 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 a it's I think a kind of an interesting way to get unique uh and leverage at the same time. And you could do this with any of the underdogs. So let's say that you liked, you know, uh a Barbosa, right? But you think he might be a little bit too popular or whatever. Well, make sure that in the Barbosa lineups, for example, you leave 800 on the table. Because I promise you that if people run run optimals. And unless they specifically are leaving that money on the table, but even if they are, it's going to be very difficult for them to, for those optimals to not get you Yusuf if you give them the $1,200, you know, lease to do that. So if you kind of trick the system into leaving 1200 in your Barbosa lineups or building Yusuf lineups and then swapping them for Barbosa, I think that's kind of a cool way to play. Um, now, again, is that optimal? I don't know. It, it seems like it, it, it would make sense. Uh, so I'm going to try that. And listen, with the Sims and the contest Sims and everybody's like trying to come up with new and interesting ways to to mess with ownership and all that stuff, I think it's kind of kind of, kind of of sneaky. Um, but we'll see. That should probably do it. It was a little bit all over the place, but I think I kind of made my points. And... Um, I guess good luck. We will st stay with us for the uh, tomorrow for the contrarian betting breakdown, which is always a lot of fun. And uh, good luck.